so I'm just going to quickly introduce our panel members, um, and then I'm going to hand over to them to, for them to tell you a little bit more about what they do and what their experience is in the field of interactive digital education. So on this side here, we have David Foley. David Foley is the Distance Education Technology Infrastructure Advisor to the New South Wales Department of Education and Communities. David manages the unit that initiated video conferencing and satellite video lessons in New South Wales schools and the distance education way back in 2003. His team provide live technical support for all rural and distance education lessons, design and manage the Connections web facility, collaborate with content providers and are also content providers themselves for schools nationally and internationally. Currently, David's unit is engaged in rolling out a new software and satellite platform for New South Wales distance education. David's a veteran educator, having held diverse roles from art teacher in a private or government school to a senior education officer for the Taronga Western Plains Zoo to equity consultant and a school principal. I'll let David tell you a bit more in a minute about his experience in digital education. Next we have Eva, and I've got you on here, Eva. Eva de Cesar is uh, one of the founding members of Monkey Bar Theatre Company, which is based in Sydney and is a national touring company, theatre company for young people. The company adapts Australian literature for the stage and develops drama workshop programs for schools throughout Australia. Eva is a writer and adapter of work, a director, an actor and an educator. She has adapted and co-adapted and performed in a number of wonderful productions, including Tim Winton's The Bugalug's Bum Thief, Morris Gleitzman's Worry Warts, Helpman award-winning plays such as Jackie French's Hitler's Daughter and Sonia Hartnett's Thursday's Child, and other books such as Millie Jack and the Dancing Cat, Emily Eifinger and Elizabeth Fencham's Goodbye Jamie Boyd. This year, Eva also co-wrote and directed the 2013 Babies Prom series for here at the Opera House. Next on our panel, we have Angela Casey. Angela is the Manager of Learning Services at the National Museum of Australia. Prior to working in museums, Angela was a theatre worker and a classroom teacher. Angela is a fan of learning activities that are dialogue-based, collaborative in nature and emotionally engaging. Next on our panel is Natalie Sullivan, and Natalie is the Digital Outreach Coordinator at Questacon, the National Science and Technology Centre in Canberra. Nat has been engaging school students with science, technology and innovation since 2010. She has toured Australia and Vietnam with various Questacon outreach programs and continues to connect with both national and international audiences by coordinating Questacon's video conference programs. Anita here we've met before and you've heard from earlier today, but just as a reminder, she's the head of Design, Society and Culture in the Faculty of Design at Swinburne University Technology in Melbourne. And as we've heard, she's done some wonderful research involved in designing new media spaces and examining and evaluating the visitor experience in these spaces. So, we're going to talk about designing and delivering educa digital education programs. So I'm going to ask a few questions of the panel members first, and then we'll throw it open to you for lots of good questions. So if I could ask you all to have one minute and just kind of give us a bit of a background in what your experience is in designing and or delivering a digital education experience. Um, I guess I sat here first, and I'm the token yep. guy, so Start I'll have a go at it. Why not? Um, look, I go back to the Flintstone ages with this, uh, where we thought it was just a good idea and our major premise for developing content was whether it was fun for us. And we still have a bit of that premise, if it's really engaging learning and we're fun and we like it and we're excited about it, we'll do it. Um, but I've had an opportunity to work with many of the content providers here in this room from um, the early aspirations through to um, them getting going and I'm thrilled with how sophisticated the content has come has come on. So um, I back to some of the speakers today's talked about the learning experience and what you want students to take home and what you want them to understand and make of what it is that you have told them is, is absolutely critical. But having said that, I've been challenged a long way along the way. Uh, authenticity was our catch cry. Everything had to be authentic. authentic. And um, you know, we had the uh, one of the ones that we didn't actually have anything to do with was the uh, Bar Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, brilliant place. But authenticity was everything. And then the uh, Historic Houses Trust came along with an actor and blew that along. And Questacon with Rob and Natalie came along with actors and science communicators. That kind of blew that out as well. So the whole way along, my notion of what is good content, good content design has been challenged. But 
right now, I know where we are now, we're very sophisticated in how we do it. This room is the absolute powerhouse. There's, um, I've been to some conferences overseas and this room is absolutely full of amazing talent with a lot of power and um, I'm really hopeful about the sort of designs uh, we see over the next couple of years. Thank you. Great. <laughs> that was really good. Um, so uh, with Monkey Bar, we've, um, uh, as an arm, to, uh, an extra arm to our company uh, in, in adapting our works, uh, the other big passion for the three of us that created the company um, was delivering, designing and delivering workshops to young people in remote and rural areas of Australia. And um, so this of having the opportunity to work with the Opera House in delivering, designing and delivering the digitals um, is, is like just a natural progression for us and it's been a really exciting couple of years developing and failing and then redeveloping and then, you know, um, coming to a really good place with our, our drama workshops. And so what we do, um, our, uh, the way we've designed it um, in collaboration with the Opera House is to give young people the journey of the actor through the Opera House um, coming through the stage door, basically. So not coming through the front, actually coming in as a performer, as, um, as a theatre maker in the Opera House. And then talking, you know, like we, we take them through the Opera House. So we also are sort of like a, a, a partner to the tour of the Opera House as well, because um, the tour takes them through, you know, all the fabulous areas of the Opera House. And we take it from an actor's perspective. Um, so it's it's very exciting for us. So we go, you know, in through the uh, I always call it the back passage, but it's not, is it? Central passage. Central passage thank you. <laughs> Central passage into um, into the um, dressing room. We talk about you know dressing room stage managers. We talk about all the different. Um, uh, careers that can happen here at the Opera House and then we take them onto the stage and depending on what theatre is available we then go through a 25 minute drama um, class with them and that is probably the most challenging but the most rewarding part of our workshop for us. So that's what we do. As someone who gets, gets to see you on the telly nearly every day, I'm really excited when I see you guys that's, up there. It's, it's very engaging. It's very exciting. The bar just keeps getting higher. <laughs> um, before I talk very briefly about the projects that we're working on at the moment, I wanted to say that um, it's been very exciting for me to work at the National Museum because I think since it opened it's been engaging with emergent te technologies and using digital technologies to engage kids. So whether it's Dave's early days of the Sony Mavica digital cameras or house bricks or... Um, you know, uh, the talkback classroom work, which I think has sort of echoed around the room today with some of the projects that have been talked about, that the National Museum of Australia has always attempted to engage with emergent technology, which is actually what we did this afternoon. We attempted to engage with emergent technology. So at the moment, we're working on the robot, as you know. Um, we've also got our fledgling video conferencing program uh, gaining strength day by day and we've just at the point now of rolling out um, a program to use digital tools to engage students who visit us on site so that's um, the museum game it's a iPad um, app for students it's a game based collaborative learning free choice adventure um, and it, sometimes it's exhausting working in areas that are emergent because it's it's continual experimentation and you're wanting to keep the standards high, but it's exciting as well. Um, hello. Uh, so uh, my role at Questacon is to coordinate the digital outreach, which for us is video conferencing. And this has come about by, um, as you'd probably be aware with Questacon, we have a number of outreach programs, in particular our flagship uh, program, the Shell Questacon Science Circus, which go out into communities um, to uh, engage students with science, technology, innovation, mathematics. Um, and so video conferencing really came up as something, as a way to extend those experiences. We didn't want to replace them, we didn't want to stop people from going out into the schools and uh, engaging with them directly, but to, ex like I said, extend the experience, make contact with them again later on, or 
perhaps make contact with them in the first place. And it's changed a lot over the last couple of years. I've had the uh, uh, honour of trying to fill Robert's shoes after <laughs> he left um, Questacon. And it, it has really branched. We've, we've tried a, a number of different things, um, particularly with um, Robert when I worked with him, uh, large events, which I know a lot of people have um, been involved in or have uh, definitely viewed over the last couple of years where we'll feature a special guest or perhaps a natural phenomenon such as the transit of Venus which occurred last year, bringing um, multi having multi-point conferences in, in that instance and then also um, our schools programs which have been one-to-one, -one, one classroom to the presenter so that the, that impact is kind of achieved more through um, the high interact in high interactivity through uh, activities. And now it's kind of changing again where we're kind of merging both of those ideas in some programs, but also trying to figure ways to get other outreach programs involved in video conferencing and getting them out that way. And I'm lucky last. Um, I'm not going to talk about the research or what I do. I'm going to now put my other hat on and talk about the work we do at the design factory at Swinburne. Uh, it's a wonderful um, collaborative space where I can draw on um, people across disciplines, across universities, across the different um, design factory networks to help the geeks who think that they will inherit the earth to consider aspects around education and the design of it. Uh, why uh, you would want to use, for example, Minecraft to um, undertake some special um, um, project or program. We work um, uh, with industry partners um, f uh, and, and the things that we've done is um, build apps to monitor um, um, various sleep disorders. We've done gaming engines for autism. Uh, we're looking at um, the role of technology with aged care. Um, we are open for any sort of interesting problem project around digital innovation. And that, um, uh, people were talking about expense and time. The beauty of working in a collaborative environment with different interdisciplinary um, mindsets and agendas is that you get to um, uh, go on a journey with this group of people and uh, figure things out and find things that you'd never ever imagine was possible. Um, for example, uh, using um, using uh, just uh, the telephone to um, in looking at um, conserving um, poo power and looking at um, how um, the problem of poo in parks by dogs, for example, um, uh, looking at new ways of um, uh, dealing with these issues through technology, uh, through uh, feedback, through capturing images of how dogs do poo and who doesn't clean them up and all this sort of stuff, has made wonderful bridges with councils, with industry partners, uh, with technologists, with software engineers, with industrial designers, scientists. These sorts of collaborations, I think, are the ways of... Um, and dogs. And the ways of, ways of the future in terms of dealing with interesting, innovative projects that are low cost, high intensive with proof of concept outputs, which I think are a fabulous way to go. So for example, our budgets for our industry partners are around 20, 30, 40,000, but we just did a, uh, a digital innovative little cookbook to go for a trial with primary school students. And we took it on because we thought it was a fantastic project for $6,000. So. Um, there's no reason why we can't have high impact output. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily um, the most, um, uh, I guess, the most uh, easy of tasks to project manage, but when you work with industry partners and students and other collaborators, if you have a um, working towards a brief and a return brief and bringing um, design and design thinking and this sort of creative process in, I find it uh, a very rewarding um, process. Thank you. Okay, we were meant to do that in five minutes. We did it in ten. So let's. Um, I'm going to ask you. I've got lots of questions here, and I want to give you a chance to ask questions. So the next one, I'm going to put you on the spot, and you can only give me three words, um, three separate words, three words that would be your major considerations if you were designing. There could be whatever type of digital education experience you want. Uh, you're thinking of, but what are your three most important considerations when designing a program that's for students, to educate students? Sorry, David. 
Only three. Three. I've used how many now? Uh, authenticity um, and uh, more than that, an honesty and excitement. Thank you. Eva? Mine. Okay, thank you. Can repeat. Uh, okay. Engagement, um, fun, and um, oh, um, Oh, God, excitement was the other one I was going to say. So, yeah. Can I use your one? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, teach training, uh, relevance, and um, logistics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tactical person. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll start with enthusiasm um, for us with the presenters. A um, uh, big one for us, I guess, activity. And I wouldn't be with Quest Khan if I didn't say inspiration. Uh, need, need, passion, and deliverables. Great, thank you. Um, okay, next question to you all is, again, in a f as few words as possible. If you're thinking about designing or delivering um, a digital education experience as opposed to a face-to-face -face normal <coughs> classroom-based experience, you know, of the past, what are what are the main differences you need to consider? Um, the trick for us is we have to get the teachers to book the content. So it, for them, the first thing has to be curriculum relevance, mm -hmm. and that it fits also fits into their time slots, which is an algorithm you just don't want to even face when, when they're going to be teaching what, but they want it to fit neatly when they want to do it. Um, and the content needs to be live and engaging and highly interactive, and you as presenters, the, the presenters, the content presenters, need to um, be reaching into those classrooms and engaging with those students through conversation and questioning pretty much immediately. And, and Dave, can I ask, are any of those things do you think different to if you were delivering a, a normal classroom education experience? Um, they're more likely to switch off and the teachers are more likely not to come back, they're more likely to cane you in their, in their evaluations. <laughs> um, and uh, our, our, our challenge is to, be, to grow video conferencing in New South Wales schools and we have an infrastructure that was kind of forced upon them. So only about half the cameras are really being used. And that means, but we're still running around 25,000 endpoint hours a month, which is significant, hmm. and um, which puts us up in the top in the world. But um, we're only just scratching the surface about what we can actually do. And it comes down to the engagement, the quality of the content and the relevance. And when national curriculum finally hits in New South Wales, we're going to need you guys to lead us into it because I'm not certain our system, I'm not confident our system is going to be very good at doing that, considering it was reluctant to be involved in the first place. And Eva, I'm just going to, we'll stop this question after Eva, but you're um, unique, I know some of you deliver, but you definitely are involved in the delivery of digital education workshops, and you've done lots of workshops face to face. Can you tell us yep. what's particular for you about delivering a digital education experience? Okay. Um, the. Well, the difference for, for us, and we, we've been discussing this in the last week, is that when we are in a classroom and we are working with young people, um, we can very, very quickly change um, what we are delivering, what, what exercises we are doing, according to the response we're getting right there and then. And we are working with one class. So we're working with probably 30 kids, maybe 40 if it's a bigger class. When we're working digitally, we've got three classes up there. It is very hard to be able to do that. Um, so we have to kind of design a program that is a little bit more one size fits all. So it's a little bit more general rather than in, in very, very specific. And sometimes if we're, because we're dealing with, with schools that are in remote and regional areas, some of those schools will be one class size, it's only eight kids, but there's a five-year-old and there's a 12-year-old. So we really need to just work more generally and um, that, that, that can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. Can I make, can I make, a, can I make a comment on the sure. sustainability? Yes. The sustainable, repeatable projects we see 
I'm impressed that the presenters never get tired of it because they're engaging with different groups. But they tend to be the most successful. Very often when some of the, our even experienced content providers try to do a one-off, they're terrible. They turn into talking heads. And that's a big challenge. Even when we do them sometimes, we, we can fall to that. Um, so it's that familiarity with the content and knowing, being ma absolutely masterful with your content um, and also masterful in that interaction with a class remotely or classes or groups remotely. Um, I see that's a very, very powerful skill, uh, something that definitely has is something special about um, remote learning. Mm. Okay, Angela, we'll just go quickly through, um, all you three, M your biggest learning in your own development on, and trialling and delivery or development of digital education programs, if you can say what your biggest learning has been. Um, um, the biggest learning, I think, has been um, that your, your modes of engagement change and the, and the types of hooks that you use to get kids in change. But obviously it's still, it's a still the same um, primary aim that you engage and inspire kids, but that sometimes that can actually work to your advantage. So, you know, we're, we're really big on handling objects at the museum. You're not going to do that in a video conference uh, connection. So it forces you to be creative. So. Thanks. Nat, do you have a, your biggest learning? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I can put it down to a biggest one. Uh, something one, one important one. One important one. Um, trying to find ways to get the students to engage in an activity without us being physically there is always a challenge, and I think we're still learning how to do that, considering that our topics change constantly as well. And. Um, Anita, just maybe one last question for you is, um, mo what's the most, one of the biggest or most unique challenges you've faced? I think at the moment, uh, dealing with a faculty of design that has to um, be gra uh, grapple with the fact that we're going to move 70%, I think, or 60 to 70% online delivery um, for practitioners is, is, has been a real problem. And, um, it's really working with the academics. As one academic said to me, and, and I, I guess not having to use the technology and the interfaces as something they hide behind. As one academic said to me, oh, that's great. So I can sit on a crate, smoke heaps of cigarettes, drink beer, and deliver my projects uh, and my subjects out to thousands of people. They never get to meet with me, and they never get to see me. They just get to see a, a facade of who I am. And I think that level of um, hiding behind the technology, that, that to me is one of the biggest challenges mm. that we face at mm. the moment. Mm. Interesting. Now, I know we're just about out of time, but is there any questions that you guys want to throw at the panel right now? Obviously, you, yes. I've got about 20 more questions written down too. <laughs> any? We'll give you guys a chance. Come on, why not? Hi, I'm just wondering if you run into any IP copyright issue to do with content, particularly involving other artists, or the um, we want some of the content to come from uh, the participants themselves and then be used multiple times across the platforms and how you've um, dealt with that. Anyone? For us in the academic space, it's, it's, um, of course, we have to deal with ethics and the approval process there, so that's very time consuming. We've now developed a blanket ethics at the design factory, um, but also IP um, um, uh, in working with any industry client, and it's quite common through the design world, is that there are various uh, waivers and we, we, we are lawyered up. Um, and this is again one of the things we have to deal with, with historians, with designers, with practitioners, with programmers. They all have their IP, and in the um, in, in in the MOOCs um, um, concept or in the delivery of of, of um, their IP to to um, and to be delivered by other providers is is a real problem, and and that's where we get resistance as well. It's the firewall, the other firewall. Yeah, the intellectual property firewall. Yeah. If you like. Um, yeah. With us, we hide behind the teacher's right to use percentage of content in a class. Um, we wouldn't record that and reproduce that over and over and over again. And with the, our, the people we work with, the content providers, we've always encouraged them 
to use their, their own authentic material that they have the rights to. But can I just say, when we bring in people for a lecture or something, um, I remember thinking about how we budget that. If we use that material five times uh, for five years, um, we have to think about how we pay for that material every time. So there are, I mean, of course, there are all those aspects around film and television and, and um, those sorts of rights, which are, are, are well-paved areas. But when it comes to... Um, um, sort of uh, uh, constant teaching and learning presentation materials. It's an area that I, I don't know if we will resolve very quickly. Mm. Any other questions? No. If they come up, we've got most of us here tomorrow, so we can keep chatting tomorrow. Did you want to make your comment, Angela? Yeah, I did. I, I did. You, um, Prior to coming, you asked us to think about um, a success, yes. and I Didn't just wanted to talk about a success that QuestCon has had. And I think it comes to the heart of one of the challenges that we have, because we're trying to roll out something that's predictable, that's bookable, that's um, that we can embed into our systems, and we're trying to bring teachers along on that journey so that they're picking up our content. And recently, I know QuestCon collaborated with the Film and Sound Archive, which is a small setup. They don't have the resources. They've got a wonderful collection, but they don't have the resources that QuestCon has. And I believe the partnership's been very successful. It's led to some great connections. And when I see that sort of collaboration going on, I get really excited. Mm. So. Mm. I, I think the success is in the room as well, because I've not known any institution or any, any, any institution to be jealously guarding their content. Mm. And um, I think uh, a success comes from, um, uh, this one's for Dave Arnold, um, a, a bureaucratic and institutional politic that allows innovation to grow. And when you have success, that you continue to grow it. Um, let's talk to, and share, and we've talked, go back to you know, the talk about classroom. Uh, National Museum was the innovator pretty much in the world with that project. And we have seen echoes of it. So. Um, so what we have now is a lot of projects, but I, I can't wait to see what they look like in 12 months' time, five years' time, mm -hmm. because they're going to be sensational. I know we won't be just using video conferencing, we're already not. Um, not even we are looking at just using video conferencing anymore. So it's a very exciting time. Mm -hmm.